Bona tarda. Molt il·lustre conseller general, honorables consellers, distingides autoritats, senyores i senyors, benvinguts a Crèdit Andorrà i gràcies per la seva assistència. En primer lloc, voldria agrair en nom de Crèdit Andorrà al senyor Robert Leninger, la seva presència avui aquí a Andorra. Ell és vicepresident de Gampo Asset Management i per nosaltres és un gran honor que ens acompanyi avui a aquesta taula. Gampo Asset Management és una companyia de serveis financers americana que és considerada com un gran referent en el sector de les inversions amb seu a Nova York. Actualment estan gestionant aproximadament 34 bilions de dòlars americans i són un equip professional d'unes 220 persones. Aquí, encara que no els agrada massa dir-ho, sí que voldria afegir que el seu soci o el seu fundador té l'honor d'estar considerat dins del grup de gurus o de seguidors del que és la inversió, Value Investing, i està dins de la categoria, o se'l sol posar a la mateixa categoria que el Warren Buffett, que el Benjamin Graham o que el Peter Lynch, que són referents en aquest tipus d'inversió. Amb la conferència d'avui el que volem és transmetre o intentar transmetre el que és la visió americana a el que és la crisi financera actual o des del que va començar el 2008 i quines han sigut les mesures que han pres allà i que els ha permès estar avui dia a la situació que estan. Així mateix farem un repàs i una valoració de les polítiques monetàries i fiscals que s'han portat a terme en aquell país i les conseqüències que aquestes han tingut a curt i mig termini en la seva economia. Desitgem que de les seves paraules es puguin sortir bones reflexions que ens ajudin a entendre i a afrontar una mica millor la crisi actual que estem patint, tant a nivell internacional com sobretot a Europa, que, com saben, està immersa en una crisi financera, econòmica i, jo diria, també institucional. El que volia fer avui és anar a una presentació que hem posat juntes Um, talking about how the United States addressed the financial crisis. Uh, we'll review some of the steps that the Federal Reserve took, the U.S. Treasury, um, how our markets have reacted to, uh, to those steps, and go over a timeline of what has taken place in the United States over the last um, four years. Again, we are very much of a U.S. stock-picking firm. So as was mentioned in the uh, introduction, we pick stocks one stock at a time. We do not call macroeconomic trends and then invest according to that uh, outlook for the economy. We find high quality companies, invest in those companies, and build our portfolio one stock at a time. So after I go through the uh, review of how the U.S. Uh, handled the financial crisis and the steps we took, I'll go into a little bit of an overview of our firm and how we go about picking stocks. Again, very much of a bottom-up fundamental stock picking um, process. So first, with regard to the United States, I'd like to just take a little time to just do a little background discussion about what happened in the United States, how the financial crisis started, um, what were some of the root causes, and then go through the timeline, of, again, of how we addressed um, the crisis in the United States. Um, at the heart in the United States, the busting of the housing bubble in 2007 is really what set off the crisis for us in the United States. We had significant uh, appreciation in the value of residential homes in the United States for many years. Uh, there was a lot of speculation going on in the market. Our financial institutions were giving easy credit terms for mortgages, and all of that led to an inflated value for real estate in the United States, which ultimately burst in the year 2007. And then after that busting of the housing bubble, uh, we had to deal with the uh, financial consequences. A big part of why we had the bubble going on were, were the actions of two organizations which are called Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. If you're not familiar with those organizations, they are US-based government-sponsored enterprises. The United States, they are private companies, but the United States government had an implicit guarantee for their business operations. So it was kind of a quasi-public-private enterprise, and what they would do was they were in the business of buying mortgages from banks and other financial institutions. 
So in the United States, when a bank would make a mortgage to an individual who wanted to buy a home, oftentimes after they made that mortgage, they would sell it to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, and ultimately it was Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac that held that mortgage and took on the risk. So as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loosened their standards and tried to encourage more people to own homes and give looser credit for people who shouldn't have the credit, that fueled the whole speculation going on in the market and was a major reason why we had the problem in the United States. This is a very, imp the next uh, point is very important in terms of what the government did. It's often overlooked in the press when you hear about this, the actions that the United States government took to address the crisis. But at this time, in order to give more confidence in the market, what the United States did was said that they will guarantee all of the money markets in the United States. Now, in the United States, your deposits at banks are insured up to $100,000 per depositor. But a money market is not insured. So a money market, you might be able to get a little higher rate with your money market account, but it is not insured by the government. What the U.S. government did was they stepped in and said, in order to give confidence to the market and make sure people don't take their money out of money markets and lose confidence in the financial system, we're going to guarantee all money markets. So essentially it became just like putting your money at the bank, the government would guarantee any losses. The reason why they did that was there was one money market, a very large one, called the reserve, which broke the buck as it's called, meaning when people came to redeem money, they could not give back 100 cents on the dollar or 100 on the euro um, because of some bad investments they had in Lehman. So when Lehman went under, that money market fund could no longer redeem money at full value, and that created uncertainty in the marketplace and the financial system, and the government just stepped in and said, we're guaranteeing everybody. In addition to incremental spending and, and all sorts of guarantees to the financial system, there was also some tax cuts that took place, again, letting individuals have more money in their own individual pocket. So some of the payroll taxes were reduced, some other taxes were reduced, um, again, as a means to put more money into the hands of individuals to try and get the economy going. There was a very strong effort to build up the, finan build up the capital ratios of the financial institutions. So th the move to Basel III which I'm sure you're familiar with, and is a more stringent regulation for the financial institutions, was pushed very hard. And all of the major American financial institutions had to undergo a very strenuous stress test. So the federal government went into all the major financial institutions and came up with Depression-era scenarios, going back to the 1930s, saying, what if we had the unemployment level of the Depression? What if asset prices fell as they did in the Depression? What if all the economic scenarios looked like the Depression? How would your financial institution fare under that scenario? And they all had to meet those requirements as part of the stress test. So during that stress test, again, they received some funding from the financial government to give them more capital. The, the major banks were told, You've got to cut your dividend. You're not buying back any shares. You've got to build up your capital. And many of them were forced to go out into the public market and raise incremental equity capital, selling to the public more shares to build up their capital. So there was a major effort to increase the capital ratios at these banks. A big reason why confidence was restored in the financial system not only was the fact that all these steps were taken, but after the stress test, banks were told if they were in good enough shape, they could start buying back their stock and raising their dividend. So high quality companies like JP Morgan, when this was over with, were told by the federal government, you have enough capital that if we have very severe problems in the economy, you will still be well enough capitalized that we feel comfortable for you to increase your dividend and buy back your stock. So there were some companies that started to raise their dividend and started to buy back their stock as a result of many of these actions taken. So that, that's kind of a quick summary 
of how in the United States we addressed the issues of the financial crisis. Um, in summary, they were very aggressive <coughs> measures. They were large measures, an awful lot of guarantees being put in place. Um, some of these measures, the measures that you're starting to take here in Europe, um, but I would say that in the United States, we were much more aggressive and much more quick in the response. And we're hopeful that, and optimistic that you will do the same here in Europe and that it'll be a good way to, uh, to address the problems. But uh, we've seen fairly good results in the United States by being very proactive and very aggressive about propping up the financial system. What I'd like to do now with some of our remaining time um, is just give you a little bit of an overview of more who we are at GAMCO and how we go about um, managing portfolios. Um, again, we're a bottom-up fundamental stock picking shop. Uh, we use what we call, and we are the ones that actually started uh, this uh, form of investing, private market value with a catalyst. I'll get a little bit more into what that means, but we are a research intensive shop. So we just went through a big macroeconomic overview, but we again do not invest by looking at the macro economy, taking macro bets, and then investing according to where we think the economy is going. We invest one stock at a time, bottom up, investing in businesses that we understand, businesses that we follow closely, and businesses that have strong cash flow generation and predictable cash flow generation. And as mentioned before, we have over a 34-year track record, very strong performance numbers. And we mentioned some of this before. Um, we ourselves went public as a company back in 1999. We're based out of Rye, New York, which is where I am from. We have offices in Asia and here. Again, we're represented by our London office and our Zurich office. Um, and we have a broad range of uh, high-quality corporate uh, relationships, and again, we're very happy to be working with Credit Andorra um, now and going into the future. This is just a quick overview of our portfolio management team. Again, the vast majority of our assets are value uh, portfolios, which we help to run with Credit Andorra. Um, Mario Gabelli is our founder and chief investment officer, and I, Robert Weininger, and numerous other individuals uh, serve with him as portfolio managers on many of the accounts, such as, uh, such as the account here. Again, I mentioned um, one of the best capitalized companies in the United States. Um, it's a company we have in the portfolio. It's not a top 10 position, but we do own a position in JP Morgan in your portfolio. And I would just point this out again. This is a company with very strong um, capital ratios, one of the best in the United States. Uh, after the stress test, they were allowed to buy back their shares. They were allowed to increase their dividend by 20%. Um, they have some very strong positions in their business lines. They're not just a retail bank or an investment bank, but they have a very strong card service businesses. They're in the asset management business. They're in treasury services. Um, they have a lot of repeat revenue type businesses. Um, the stock took a little bit of a hit in the short term when they announced that they were going to take a $2 billion trading loss in their trading portfolio, uh, which was a disappointment that, but they, that they did that. But again, since we are long-term focused, we did not sell it out of the portfolio as a result of that because we viewed that more as a one-time loss that they would have. We are concerned about potential regulatory consequences for the industry. If they're tighter regulations, that would not be good. But uh, we view it as a high-quality financial institution at an attractive price. Again, trading at a discount to PMV of approximately 34% with a current return of 3.6% and a dividend that we believe will rise over the years. So we, again, are taking the longer-term approach. It's just, again, who we are. Um, again, we've only been with uh, Credit Andorra for a little bit, so it's only been a few months. We we're outperforming by close to 100 basis points. It's been down market. We're down by less, but uh, look forward to better absolute returns going forward. Just a quick little snapshot of uh, the portfolio. We have 40 names, uh, mostly large cap names over 10 billion, some names under 2 billion. We're finding an awful lot of value in the sort of 10 billion to $30 billion price range. Um, we have average market cap here of about $56, $58 billion. So it's a little bit less than the S&P 500. So we have a little smaller cap in the aggregate. 